Well, good evening, everybody. So grateful to be with us here at ULT San Diego. And the presentation for this evening is entitled Shiva and Self Regeneration, which will be given to us by Nathan Johnston. But we thank you, Nathan. Okay, thank you. Let me just get my slides going here. Oh, but oh, but I wanted to do before you get started, as you're doing that, I'd like to do the reading. Oh, please do. Okay. This is from the Maha Chohan, Rebirth in Spirit. Once unfettered, delivered from their dead weight of dogmatism, interpretations, personal names, anthropomorphic conceptions, and salaried priests, the fundamental doctrines of all religions will be proved identical in their esoteric meaning. Osiris, Krishna, Buddha, Christ will be shown as different means for one and the same royal highway of final bliss, nirvana. Mystical Christianity teaches self-redemption through one's own seventh principle, the liberated Paramatma, called by the one Christ, by others Buddha. This is equivalent to regeneration or rebirth in spirit, and it therefore expounds just the same truth as the nirvana of Buddhism. All of us have to get rid of our own ego, the illusory apparent self, to recognize our true self in a transcendental divine life, the Mahachana. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Okay, so let me begin this evening by honoring the ancient and noble practice of saluting those who have made this talk possible. All of the people who have come before me in this Aquarian series have certainly made you know, mention of, of, of Shiva and have certainly demonstrated for all of us you know, how, to, how to share uh, from the heart um, our, our questions and our wonderings, which uh, this has been quite a journey for me, um, just trying to determine where we are in time and space and theosophy. Um, but we will revisit some of the themes that we've looked at in other talks heard at the San Diego United Lodge of Theosophists tonight. And um, I will be drawing upon many sources, including uh, the Theosophical Movement published in Mumbai, the journal Hermes published by Concord Grove Press, and the words of some contemporary devotees of Shiva, that can be found by the end of the talk, a hyperdoc. So you can have the various um, sources that I resourced in, in producing this talk. So our topic tonight is Shiva and self-regeneration, where we will explore some of the ideas from the legends associated with Mahashivaratri and the teachings of theosophy. Uh, the quote from Hermes for this week is, uh, self-conscious participation in the cosmic fire of universal sacrifice is the great privilege offered in an initiatory mode by Shiva. So let's explore what this might mean for us to learn from Shiva, who is Mahadeva, the most supreme God. Ants. All right. So from the sage Vasishtha, we are told that Lord Shiva said, Mahadeva is adored by the wise as intellect and conscious soul, and also as pervading and supporting all being. He is situated alike in pots and paintings, in trees and huts, and in the vestures of all men and creatures. He has the several names Shiva, Hara, and Hari, Brahma, Indra, Agni, and Yama. He is both within and without all things as the universal soul. 
and dwells in the spirit and soul of every wise man. He is worshipped in various forms and modes by diverse peoples. Here we have a painting, it's about a hundred year old painting that depicts Shiva drinking the Kalakuta, which literally means black mass or time puzzle. Also called Hala Hala, this is the, the name of a poison that was created when the Devas and Asuras churned the ocean of milk in order to obtain Amrita, the nectar of immortality. And we'll get into that story a little later. But it is said that he held that poison in his neck, which bruised and turned blue. And that's why we call him Nilkant, you know, for the blue neck. Lord Shiva is the deity of time over all, Kala, and is related to Saturn, which is one of the, the, the slowest moving among the major planets, referred to as the great karmic reckoner. Hmm, wish that you hmm. see that better. But oh well, moving on. Mahashivaratri, the vigil night of Shiva, is marked by the last visible crescent of the waning moon on the 13th night uh, uh, through the 14th day of the month of Falguna in the Hindu calendar. This year's celebration will begin six days from today on March 8th and last through the night until the day of March 9th. There is a Shivaratri on the 13th night or 14th day of every month in the Hindu calendar observing the convergence of Lord Shiva with the goddess Shakti. The main festival, Maha Shivaratri, is celebrated only once a year, and Shiva devotees observe strict spiritual discipline and stay up all night in meditation and prayer, singing devotional songs, making offerings, and performing ceremonial baths to worship Shiva in different forms during each successive four nights, uh, 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 successive three hour periods of the night on Maha Shivaratri. So the importance of Maha Shivaratri festival is mentioned in the, the Puranas, which um, describe various legends and significance of the various forms of worship. This is said to be the day when Lord Shiva performs the heavenly dance of creation, preservation and destruction. And it is also, according to one legend, the day that Shiva and Parvati got married. And it is also the day that Lord Shiva drank the hala hala produced during the churning of the ocean of, the, of, of milk. But perhaps most significant to theosophists would be the observance of Maha Shivaratri as a time for remembrance of overcoming darkness and ignorance in life and the world, and to meditate upon ethics and virtues such as honesty, non-injury to others, charity, forgiveness, and the discovery of Shiva. So as students of theosophy, we have the good fortune to consider what might be the noumenon of Shiva through meditation upon the various qualities observed in external forms of worship and move towards an appreciation of our own identity in relation to this wondrous being who is said to be known by 1,008 names, Maheshvara, the great Lord, the yogi of yogis, and Dakshinamurti, initiator of initiates. In his, his teachings on Aquarian therapy, Raghavan Iyer reminds us that the great teachers of Gupta Vidya hint that the noumenon of the three in one, the inmost invisible triad in every human being and the source of all thought, will, and feeling, itself has an invisible central point in Akasha the noumenon, which is the very essence of spiritual fire. So kindling this spiritual fire, keeping vigil, and dedicating ourselves to the potential for regeneration in ourselves and others begins with an awareness of an invisible central point that is the supreme reality in each one of us. So I just had to get back to basics. In, in creating this talk, like what is Akasha? 
In a literal sense, it is the sky. It is the space from which or through which everything emerges in time. And the invisible central point is everywhere present. Between every beat of our heart and between and within every cell of our body. In the secret doctrine, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky tells us study this. No. there is a corresponding really Akasha and the fifth universal cosmic principle from which our human principle of manas is derived. In the Theosophical Glossary, she describes Akasha as the subtle, supersensuous essence which pervades all space, the primordial substance from which radiates the first logos or expressed thought. That is why it is stated in the Puranas that Akasha has but one attribute, namely sound, for sound is but the translated symbol of logos, speech in its mystic sense. Devotees consider Lord Shiva to be the father of all sounds, languages, music, and vibrations in the universe. It is said that from the beating of the Damaru, that's the, that drum right there, right? But from the beating of the Damaru by Lord Shiva, the very first sound was produced, which is called Nada. And this sound was made in the void of nothingness and formed the basis for the world and the meaning of the world. Like the Logos that is described in the scriptures of other traditions, this Nada essentially was the vibration of creation of which the symbols are provided in the form of the Sanskrit language. The pulsations emanating from his drum are the very same vibrations that the ancient rishis experienced in deep meditation and which they then expressed in the form of utterances. These verbal articulations then became the Vedas and the revealed texts. According to tradition, Panini, the great Sanskrit grammarian, composed the Maheshvara Sutras and created the basic rules of Sanskrit grammar after he saw Shiva in a vision dancing in front of him and listened to the sounds he made with his Dhammaru. But who is this Shiva to produce the sound from nothingness, the meaning of life, the supreme reality within each one of us? And, and who are we to contemplate this supreme reality? What is our relationship to this wondrous being who makes spiritual regeneration possible in every point in space? And what is our relationship to the one who we are taught endowed us with the spark of this spiritual fire in the, the self-consciousness that illuminates our fifth principle, manas? Well, I have found that questions of identity are indissolubly linked with questions of beginnings and questions of where we come from. HPB writes that before our globe became egg-shaped and the universe also, a long trail of cosmic dust or fire mist moved and writhed like a serpent in space. The worlds, including our own, were, of course, as germs, primarily evolved from the one element in its second stage, whether we call it, with modern science, cosmic dust and fire mist, or with occultism, akasha, jiva atma, divine astral light, or the soul. So when we look to the sky, the band of light that we in the West call the Milky Way is actually the plane of the disk of the galaxy that is the home of our solar system, together with the nebulae, uh, or interstellar gas and dust, and at least 200 billion other stars and their planets that are also known in India as the Akash Ganga, the river of the sky. But what is it that we are looking at? The secret doctrine explains on page 162 and 163 how the soul of the world evolved from one element present throughout space and that before the separation of the sexes in the third race, this element incarnated as the sons of wisdom. 
who produced by Kriya Shakti, or what might be called thought power, or the power to create, a progeny who was not a race. This progeny, it, it was at first a wondrous being called the initiator, and after him, a group of semi-divine and semi-human beings set apart in archaic Genesis for certain purposes. They are those in whom are said to have incarnated the highest dhyanis, munis, and rishis from previous manvantaras to form the nursery for human adepts on this earth and during the present cycle. These sons of will and yoga, born, so to speak, in an immaculate way, remained, it is explained, entirely apart from the rest of, human, of mankind. So this is like one step removed from, 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 the, Akasha, from, the, from the darkness. This is like, this is what I spent weeks thinking about. I'm just going to forge, forge ahead. The being just referred to, which has to remain nameless, is the tree from which, in subsequent ages, all the great historically known sages and hierophants, such as the Rishi Kapila, Hermes, Enoch, Orpheus, etc., etc., have branched off. It is he who changes form, yet remains ever the same, and it is he again who holds spiritual sway over the initiated adepts throughout the whole world. He is, as said, the nameless one who has so many names and yet whose names and whose very nature are unknown. This wondrous being was said to have descended from a high region with a name that can only be translated by several compound words into English, the ever-living human banyan tree. And I might add also that, you know, if uh, I'm thinking about this as our, who we are in the, in the, in the, at that central invisible point of ourselves, which is the noumenal essence of spiritual fire, which we sh would share with this, with the nature of reality. Um, and, you know, and Shiva, when, when, in the early Vedas, he wasn't even mentioned by the name Shiva, and neither was Brahma. These, these, you know, they, they had other. There were there were other names that that evolved into into the names of of, of Shiva and Brahma. But it, it's like if you think about it, just the beat of the drum. I mean, it takes a while sometimes to to be able to pronounce things by their by the names that we know them by now. So. So. So this wondrous being descended from a high region, it says in the secret doctrine, with a name that can only be translated by several compound words into English, the ever living human banyan. So it's like a tree. And it appears as if this same being is referred to in plural form as the sons of will and yoga and of the fire mist produced by Kriya Shakti from the sons of wisdom. These are things to meditate to meditate upon. While the, while the sons of wisdom may be one with the noumenal essence of the Trimurti, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, at the center of the cosmos and every point in space, it is this ever-living human banyan who is the Maha Guru, the great teacher. And HPV tells us it is under the direct silent guidance of this great guru that all the other less divine teachers and instructors of mankind became from the first awakening of human consciousness, the guides of our early humanity. And it is through these sons of God that infant humanity got its first notions of all the arts and sciences, as well as spiritual knowledge. And it is they who have laid the first foundation stone of those ancient civilizations that puzzle so sorely our modern generation of students and scholars who wonder how they put together these buildings without any kind of nails or mortar or anything like that. She points out that she points to recorded history and the rules of proportion in architecture to, to question the possibility that, that any man descended from the Paleolithic cave dweller 
could ever evolve such a science unaided, even in millenniums of thought and intellectual evolution. So when we talk about the Kumaras, these are, I mean, there's different names I've been learning about this. The Kumaras are the mind-born sons of, of Brahma Rudra or Shiva, the howling and terrific destroyer of human passions and physical senses, which are ever in the way of the development of the higher spiritual perceptions and the growth of the inner eternal man. So mystically, are the progeny of Shiva, the Maha Yogi, the great patron of all the yogis and mystics of India. They themselves, being the virgin ascetics, refuse to create the material being man. And if you look into it, you know, there's a, a there's a bunch of people who are referred to as Manasa Putras, which are mind, sons of the mind, Manas and Putra, sons of the mind, born of the mind. This include the, the Prajapatis, and there are these different names and people, just like in our own families, names are passed down, and it's kind of hard to tell who is uh who's being referred to sometimes. But you know, I think the idea is that we just need to keep on making those names better. <laughs> if that's possible, when we when they start out so good. Um, but, you know, another story of the Kumara is associated with Mahashivaratri that um, after the marriage of Shiva and Sati, a Rishi had invited them to his ashram and, and um, Shiva saw Rishi Atarva sitting there and he seemed a little uncomfortable and he was a little hesitant to speak. And Shiva's like, what's going on? You know, why you, you seem uncomfortable. And Rishi Atarva said, well, actually, you know, I had something I wanted to, to share with a wise person. It's like I, I, I've created this wonderful doctrine of knowledge and um, I'd like, you know, you to, I'd like it to be validated. So in, in this doctrine, this is it consisted of day to day things, material needs, health and medicine. And Shiva, after reading it, declared that the book was so necessary and so well written that it should be titled the fourth Veda. Uh, and though everyone there praised the Atarva Veda. The four mind-born sons of Brahma did not agree to the fact that Shiva, this, this hermit, you know, with his, you know, the ashes smeared on his body, I suppose, you know, the matted hair, that he had the authority to instantiate the fourth Veda amongst the ones created by their father. So they went to this Daksha. And again, these are names that, that, are, that are used in different periods of ev evolution. But in this case, this is the Prajapati Daksha father of Sati also, who asked them to have a, a debate um, according to the scriptures and, and Shiva uh, agreed to it and, and they arranged for their seating in such a way that Shiva's seat was facing north and the Sanat Kumars were facing south. And it, but it kind of, you know, it, it hurt the ego of these, of the, of the Kumaras who, who argued that due to their immense knowledge, they should have the respect of facing north. So Shiva agreed to that too, and he sat facing south. And the Sanat Kumars fired these numerous Vedic verses, and Shiva, the Mahayogi, countered each of them, giving rational arguments backed by the initial three Vedas. So uh, Sarasvati was there, and and she, you know, they they call her the mother of the, the Vedas, and she was the the judge, and she she determined that uh, you know uh, Shiva was the the winner of this, of the, um, of the debate. Now, the, the Kumaras were still confused with the fact, how could a fourth Veda exist when already three were created uh, by Brahma? And how could Rishi Atarva have such immense knowledge? And Shiva explained to them that uh, once upon a time, Atarva was, um, he, he'd, he'd been someone else before and, and he was pinned, he was, he was the demon Hayagriva, and he had stolen the Vedas from Brahma and, and uh, had been pinned down by, by Vishnu, um, went to Shiva asking for some help. And um, Shiva said, yeah, nobody can help you. Nobody can save you from Vishnu, who is pinning him down. But it gave him a blessing that upon his death at Vishnu's hands, he would be able to retain the knowledge of the fourth Veda till his next birth. And so Atarva is none other than the demon Hayagriva reborn. Brahma has four heads, so there must have been four Vedas, but the fourth never reached the humans until now, a couple thousand years ago. So again, the, the Sanat Kumars praised Shiva for his glory and begged for his pardon in making him sit 
facing the southern direction, but you know, she was okay with it. He, they instantiated him as Dakshina Murti, the Lord facing the south. Now it's so interesting. This is not the. This will not be the first time we hear of Shiva being kind of uh, underrated somehow because you know the Kumaras didn't didn't really recognize Shiva as their progenitor and supreme in his wisdom beyond all appearances or status as a cave dweller with matted hair and his body smeared with with ashes. So perhaps there may be many of us who make a similar mistake in recognizing the undisputed authority of the sovereign spirit because we're confused by appearances. So the, the Yoga Vasishtha Maharamayana states that the offering of the heart in meditation unto the Lord is more delectable to him than the sweetest articles of food or the most delicate and fragrant flowers. Meditation, joined with self-consciousness and contrition, is the padya and argya most worthy of the Lord. So these are like, you know, the water for the feet or, and the offerings of, of water. The best meditation is that accompanied with the flower self-offering to the Lord. Without this meditation, it is impossible to realize the supreme soul in oneself. Therefore, spiritual meditation is said to abound with divine grace and the greatest ananda and artha, or, or bliss and, and, and aim or purpose. The ignorant man who meditates upon Mahadeva for a thousand twinklings of the eye obtains as reward the merit of making the gift of a milk cow to a brahmana. The man who worships the Lord in his soul for half an hour in this manner reaps the reward of making the Ashva Meda sacrifice. He who meditates upon the Lord in spirit, in his own spirit, and presents the offering of his reflections unto him is entitled to the merit of a thousand such sacrifices. And I bring this up simply because we're kind of you know, looking at some theosophical teachings and then thinking about Mahashivaratri coming up here. And what I found, especially looking at the theosophical movement published in, in, um, in uh, Mumbai, you know, we want to be really, uh, you know, aware of the inner meaning of these of these things, and not to be focused on external forms. So, but think about we're going to get back to this. The a half an hour of meditation reaps the word of making the Ashvamedha sacrifice. And now, let me just tell you a little bit about this Ashvamedha sacrifice. So, in Vedic times. The ancient kings would engage in rituals to prove their imperial sovereignty. And one such ritual was the Ashva made a sacrifice in which a horse accompanied by the king's warriors would be released to wander for a year. And in the territory traversed by the horse, any rival could dispute the king's authority by challenging the warriors accompanying it. And after one year, if no enemy had managed to kill or capture the horse, the animal would be guided back to the king's capital. It would then be sacrificed, and the king would be declared as an undisputed sovereign. So it is interesting to note that the Vasishtha Maharamayana makes mention of the value of meditation in relation to Lord Shiva compared to the reward of making the Ashvamedha sacrifice, among others. But th this is an incredible expense that is, that is involved. But if we just meditate for half an hour, we've gained the same benefit. And, I, and just think about that. If you're ever, you don't even have to be mad. But let's say, let's say that you're mad and you can just sit and still the mind for half an hour. Think about all of the, all of the, the trouble that you'll save, the, the course that you'll set yourself on. And if you're not mad, if you're just going to be focusing on the on the that invisible numinal point in the center of space, the spiritual fire, well, all the better. Okay, so there once was a king Sagara who performed this Ashva Ashva Meda Yagna Yagya ninety nine times, and on the the hundredth time, story goes, Indra was so jealous of him that he kidnapped the horse and he. And he uh, he hid him in the in the ashram of the of a, of a muni near the sea, and when the horse didn't come back, 
after the 99th or after the 100th time, the king asked his 60,000 sons to go out and find the horse. And they started searching for the horse and they kept searching for a really long time, but they couldn't find him anywhere. And at last, near Ayodhya, near the sea, they found the horse inside the Kapil Muni ashram. The sage there, Kapil Muni, was in deep meditation. And those 60,000 sons, they, they did not know how to sit for 30 minutes, I'm telling you. They thought that the Kapil Muni had captured their horse and they attacked this meditating sage. But due to his intense tapas, his, his intense powers developed through meditation, just a gaze of this, of this Muni, all 60,000 sons of King Sagara were burnt into ashes. And when, they, when these... Sons didn't return after so many days. King Sagara asked his grandson to go and search for the horse and his six sons. And uh, his grandson eventually found the horse inside the, the Muni's ashram. Um, and Bill Muni was also um, meditating at that time. But um, the grandson waited patiently for the, for the sage to come out of his meditation. And after the sage opened his eyes, he was very happy to see uh, this grandson's patience and perseverance. And he told him, that um, what happened to the 60,000 sons and gave, gave him a chance to ask for a boon. So the grandson asked, asked that he release the horse and salvage his dead father and uncles. Of course, Kapil Muni immediately released the horse, but he told this grandson that, that the salvage of his father and his uncles is now only possible by the sacred waters of Ganga that was currently in heaven with Brahma. So yeah, okay. So the grandson goes back to his his um, his grandfather, who tells him the whole story about what happened to the to the the sixty thousand sons and what needs uh, and what needs to happen. And King Bhagirath, um, you know, observed a penance to to Brahma for a thousand years, and I'll tell you what, he was not successful. And then you know, successive gen succeeding generations. You know, it made an made an effort to uh, you know gain the 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 favor of, of Brahma and bring Ganga, the, the river Ganga, to to earth. But they were not successful either until finally a great a, a grandson a grandson, apparently, for a thousand years meditated and um, gained the the merit uh, that pleased Brahma, who who said, "Okay, this is great. We can bring this is, I mean." I'm just curious about how this relates to the to the fire mist and the formation of our galaxy. But time kind of when 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 he swallowed when Shiva swallowed that uh, what do you call it the the time puzzle. I think everything's happening at the same time. But but the fact is we've got the 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 Milky Way the the Akash Ganga is out is out there in space. But to to uh, redeem the souls of these of these um, sixty thousand suns and wash away their ashes it needs to come to Earth. But if but when you bring the the celestial river to Earth, it's going to hit pretty hard unless you have somebody who can who can who can help to break the flow. And so that's what that's where Shiva came came in. The you know all the way from from space, we, we've got this the, the the sky river comes down and lands in his locks, the locks of his hair, his matted hair. And it and it cushions the fall so that and then and it creates the the river Ganga here on Earth, so and it was also able to to wash away the the ashes of Bhagirath's ancestors. King, um, so this is a good story. Another legend from the from the we already talked about this a little bit, but um, uh, you know, once upon a time there was. Uh, well, it's kind of a long story, but. But what ended up happening was another sage, I'm telling you, if anybody just meditates on love and peace, imagine what we can do. Because all of these sages in the olden days, they would get, they would get to be, they would be cursing people. They would curse. One of them cursed, one of the, one of the Munis cursed Indra and, um, and all the devas. And they were losing their strength, apparently. So they had to work together with the asuras to get the elixir of immortality out of this ocean of milk, which is like the fifth ocean from the center of the of the of the the, the world. And so they worked together with the with the asuras, um, and they they wrapped you know Vasuki, who's like this this um, 
serpent man person around the spur Mandara of Mount Mandara, which is actually a spur of Mount Kailash, um, which is where where Shiva, you know, it, uh, abides. But they, you know, they 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 were trying to get, you know, they were trying to get the gifts. Uh, well, one of them was the elixir of immortality, and there's different ways that the story goes. But um, in one of the stories, um, I think Vasuki kind of spits up this poison. In another story, it's it, it comes up out of the ocean, and it and and this this poison, you know, they call it the time puzzle. They call it the black mass. It can destroy everything, and everyone's worried about this. So they go to Shiva, and they say, "Can can you help us with this?" And he says, "Yeah, no problem." So he drinks it, and, it, and that's why he's got the blue neck, right? Um, so out of compassion of living beings, he drinks the, the, the poison and and it can it can stay there in his neck without going up or down, leaves everybody unharmed. But now as part of the therapy for the night, the doctors advised, they told him, Shiva, you know, we really think you should stay up tonight. You know, just stay up the whole night. Let's let's not let's not go to sleep. It's just like he had a concussion or something. But that is part of the legend of the Mahashivaratri is that because um you know, to keep him awake all night, the gods perform took turn performing various dances and playing and playing music, and this was the like the like the first uh, Maha Shiva, Shivaratri. Since then, on this day and night, devotees fast, keep vigil, and sing glories of the Lord and meditate. So, as Numenon, the totality of Shiva is formless and uncircumscribable female as well as male, at the root base of all the hierarchies of nature. The Yoga Vasishta Mahara Ramayana describes Shiva's power of self-regeneration as the goddess Kali, Kali, and the power of the intellect, ignorant of herself and ever prone to action, conversant with all the elements of being and non-being. So it's interesting because in in these ancient scriptures, the 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 feminine, it's it's like there's been a there's been a little bit of a reversal. Like we often think about the in in our times about the masculine being the active principle, but in 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 this scripture, um, the you know the goddess is in in the feminine aspect of 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 our nature is considered to be the one who roves about. So, um, you know, she contains the world in the vibration of her mind as airy cities and palaces are contained in the power of imagination. She herself is that world as the imagination itself is the utopian city. She is the volition of Shiva, like the wind in the air. As the air is still without its vibration, so Shiva is quiescent without his volitional power. This Arupa volition becomes the Rupa creation. Just as the formless sky produces the wind which vibrates into sound, thus does the will of Shiva bring forth the world out of itself. When this volitional energy of Kali dances and plays within the void of the divine mind, the world springs forth as if by union of the active will and the infinite field of that supreme mind. It also is uh, no sooner does this power come in contact with Shiva, the prime cause of all, than it inclines and turns to assume the veil of nature and its conversion to external form. Forsaking her boundless and elemental form, she takes upon herself the gross and limited shapes of land and hills, and then becomes the beautiful forms of forests and flowers. In the great round, she re-becomes the formless void and again is one with the infinite vacuum of Shiva, just as a river with all its impetuous speed enters into the immensity of the sea. She becomes as one with Shiva by giving up her identity as an aspect of Shiva. This feminine form of Shiva is merged back into Shiva, the prime male. 
who is the form of the formless void in perfect tranquility. So when we are overly, and so I just, I, I just pointing, pointing out like this goddess is Shiva. It's, it's the same thing, you know, it's, uh, um, when we are overly identified with the external form or inevitable dissolution of our physical body, we may experience considerable discomfort, which can only be dissolved by the formless void and perfect tranquility. I just want to say, I saw a comment come up. I think that's the river Ganga. I think that's pouring into, you know, that's what I think it is. When, when it says what is coming out of her head. But this is the this is um, Ardhanaris Vara, the Lord who is half woman and and represents the synthesis of masculine and feminine energies of the universe, Purusha and Prakriti, so the spirit and matter and and this illustrates how Shakti, the female principle of God, is inseparable from or the same as Shiva, the male principle of God, and vice versa. The union of these principles is, is, is exalted as the root and womb of all creation. His, hers, theirs is the power of transformation. And the transgender creative force of evolution we inherited from the first chaste Kumaras who lit up the minds of our ancestors. Those who follow the devotional path must cleanse their mind of this tendency to over-identify with external forms in order to regenerate the spiritual self and develop the dissolving action power, which is Kriya Shakti, the power to do or create, and the privilege of self-consciousness and what makes us human in relation to the ever-living human banyan tree born from the Manasa Putras of Brahma Shiva, from Manasa mind, and Putra, son. The coming generations are expanding their awareness of what it means to be a human being in the fullest sense of the word, beyond ritualistic and unthinking replication of sex and gender roles and superficial tokens of masculinity and femininity, to stand on behalf of those who live on the boundary between masculine and feminine, balancing all identification with the body and external signs of sexuality with the freedom that is our true. Now let's remember that while some believe that the symbol of the lingam associated with Shiva is a phallic symbol, this contrasts with the traditional abstract values of devotees of Shaivism, wherein the lingam yoni connote the masculine and feminine principles in the entirety of creation and all existence. According to one scholar, the terms lingam and yoni became explicitly associated with human sexual organs in the Western imagination after the widely popular first Kama Sutra translation by Sir Richard Burton in 1883. In his translation, even though the original Sanskrit text does not use the words lingam or yoni for sexual organs, Burton avoided being viewed as obscene to the Victorian mindset of the period by, by avoiding the use of words such as penis, vulva, vagina, and other direct or indirect sexual terms in the Sanskrit text to discuss sex, sexual relationships, and human sexual positions. So he used the terms lingam and yoni instead throughout the translation, and this conscious and incorrect word substitution states Wendy Doninger, um, it served as an Orientalist means to anthropologize sex, to distance it, and make it safe for English readers by assuring them or pretending to assure them that the text was not about real sexual organs, their sexual organs, but, but merely about these, you know, the appendages of, of what she's called weird, dark people far away. Now, the original meaning of lingam as sign is used in the Shvetest. Vara Upanishad, which says that Shiva, the Supreme Lord, has no liuga, meaning he is transcendental beyond any characteristic and specifically the sign of gender. 
Lingam is regarded as the outward symbol of the formless reality, the symbolization of merging of the primordial matter, prakriti, with the pure consciousness, purush, transcendental context. So the, the term linga also appears in early Indian texts on logic, where an inference is based on a sign, linga, such as if there is smoke, there is fire, where linga is the smoke. It is a religious symbol in Hinduism representing Shiva as the generative power all of existence, all creativity and fertility at every cosmic level. And then HPB in The Secret Doctrine also tells us that the Mahadeva is represented in the posture of an ascetic as Mahayogi with his third eye, which is the Ru set upright on the Tau cross in another form. In the white Yajur Veda, it is in the white Yajur Veda that he appears for the first time as the great god, Mahadeva, whose symbol is the lingam. And she goes, she goes on on page 404 and 405 in um, volume two to describe another one of the, one of the um, signs of, of Shiva, the pasa, held in the hand in such a way that it is the first finger and hand near the thumb which make the cross or loop and crossing. Our Orientalists would have it to represent a cord to bind refractory offenders with because, forsooth, Kali, Shiva's consort, has the same as an attribute. But the Pasa has here a double significance, as also has Shiva's Trisula and every other divine attribute. The significance lies in Shiva as Rudra has certainly the same meaning as the Egyptian unsated cross in its cosmic and mystic meaning. In the hand of Shiva, it becomes linga and yonic. That which is meant is this. Shiva, as said before, is unknown by that name in the Vedas. In Rig Veda, he is called Rudra, Rudra the howler, the beneficent and maleficent deity at the same time, the healer and the destroyer. In the Vishnu Purana, he is the god who springs from the forehead of Brahma, who separates into male and female, and he is the parent of the Rudras or Maruts, half of whom are brilliant and gentle and uh, the others black and ferocious. So in the Vedas, he is the divine ego, aspiring to return to its pure deific state and at the same time, that divine ego imprisoned in earthly form, whose fierce passions make of him the roarer, the terrible. Brahma calls him Rudra and gives him, besides, seven other names, which names are his seven forms of manifestation. Also the seven powers of nature, which destroy, but to recreate or regenerate. Hence, the cruciform, noose, Pasa in his hand when he is represented as an ascetic, the Maha Yogin, has no phallic signification, and it indeed requires a strong imagination bent in this direction to find such even in an astronomical symbol. As an emblem of door, gate, mouth, the place of outlet, it signifies the straight gate that leads to the kingdom of heaven. So another legend narrates the story of the vain search by Brahma and Vishnu to discover the beginning and the end of, of Lord Shiva. So according to, the, to numerous Puranas, once Brahma and Vishnu were fighting over each other's prowess and they were, you know, all the other gods horrified at the intensity of the, the battle, asked Shiva to intervene and to make them realize the futility of their fight, Lord, Vish, Lord Shiva assumed the form of a flaming linga in between Brahma and Vishnu and challenged both of them by asking them to measure the gigantic pillar of light that was the, the linga and the sign of his potency. And uh, Brahma and Vishnu decided to find one end and you know each of them to establish supremacy over the other. But uh, Lord Brahma took the form of a swan and went upwards, while Lord Vishnu assumed the form of Varaha, a boar, and went into the earth towards Netherland. Both searched for thousands of miles, but neither could find the end. 
And there was a little bit of fibbing involved. Apparently, you know, Brahma came back with a with a kataki flower, said that he saw the saw the end. And um, but anyways, he, he was he was making that up. And and the story goes that that Shiva said that does it for you, Brahma. Nobody's going to be worshiping you, you know, in in the temples. And the kataki flower is not going to be uh, available for you know as a proper form of. Um, as a proper offering, in which they say explains why there's not so many Brahma temples in in India. But since it was on the 14th day in the dark fortnight of the month of Falguna that Shiva first manifested in the form of a linga, the day is extremely auspicious and, as we know, is celebrated as Mahashivaratri, the great night of Shiva. So this is an iconic representation it's the it's it's the form of the formless is what we have with the with the lingam um so it is it is often represented within a disc-shaped platform the yoni its feminine counterpart consisting of a flat element horizontal compared to the vertical lingam and designed to allow liquid offerings to drain away for collection but together they symbolize the merging of microcosmos and macrocosmos the divine eternal process of creation and regeneration and the union of feminine and masculine that recreates all existence kind of like the yin yang sign so this is from a, a an article that i will include in the the link to the hyperdoc i will share with you at the end of this evening but it's from a um, an article called uh, saturn from the journal hermes it says shiva demands a return to the simplicity of being before generation to the golden age when human beings were truly spheroidal in consciousness and form. Such a return is frightening to most people because it necessitates an abandonment of all the accoutrements of the separate self and even of the hope that springs thereof. Few are willing and capable of attempting to do this. But the unappeasable dynamism of Shiva will not be denied, and the realization of this necessity will come either by choice or through the unending collisions brought about by karma life after life. The circle of flames around Shiva Nataraja burns away the temporal forms and hopes we so desperately cling to. For the Tiruvasi flame surrounding Shiva is that Maya which must be penetrated in order to move up along the spokes leading to the pranava in its midst. In the Tandava, Shiva is encircled by his Tiruvasi, a flame fed by divine forming power, but reflecting the individual and material energy of nature. Shankara called the circle Maya, realizing which leads to the pranava, the own lord and and removes illusion so considering this one sees that the maya of shiva is different from that of vishnu shiva's dance is that of involution and evolution creating the illusion of the appearance and disappearance of worlds the maya of vishnu is the very charm of life that of shiva the illusion of life and death themselves Shiva creates, and as he creates, he destroys through his illusion. So the, you can see the, the Lord dances on the form of a tiny demon, Absamara Parusha, the symbol of ignorance and forgetfulness. Unfettered by ignorance, Shiva is ever free. And in his upper right hand, he holds the Damaru, the small drum from which he produces the pulsation of matra shakti, the sound vibrations represented by the Sanskrit alphabet and that take the form of the entire universe. This is Shiva's first dance, first dance of creation. So, in his essay on Shiva and self re regeneration, the teacher makes the statement that human beings must resolve to stand on their own. And he indicated that Shiva is the supreme principle of potent ideation and constructive imagination in the cosmos, bridging what is bound and conditioned within the realm of time and our external environment with what is boundless and unconditioned in the deathless core of our being. We are called upon to ask, what does it mean to wake up to the fact? 
as the author points out in his essay, that each is alone in the world, that each is the custodian of his or her own hopes and promises, and that each is the only agent able to make a radical change in his or her own kingdom. There is no substitute for staying awake when the stakes are high, and in doing everything we can for the human family, we may not know what we are doing, and we may feel the gap between the ideal and the reality of what we are able to give for the sake of others. But there is something in each one of us that will find a way in the most challenging circumstances. So as in the story of Lubdaka, um, a poor tribal man and a devout worshiper of Lord Shiva who once went into the deep forest to collect firewood. And as the darkness engulfed the jungle, Lubdaka lost his way and could not find his way home. And he became extremely terrified as the deep growls of animals began to fill the jungle. Seeking uh, protection till daybreak, he climbed the nearest bell tree and sought safety and shelter in its branches. And since he was perched on the branch of a tree, he was afraid that if he dozed, he might fall off the tree. But to keep himself awake all night, he decided to pluck one leaf from the bell tree and drop it while chanting the name of Shiva. By sunrise, this devout person realized that he had dropped thousands of leaves onto a Shiva lingam, which he had not seen in the darkness. This all night uh, worship pleased the Lord Shiva and his, uh, by his divine grace, tigers and other wild animals went away. And so Lubdaka not only survived, but he, he was rewarded with divine bliss. Um, and according to the Puranas ever, ever since that day, the story has been re recited every year on the night of Mahashivaratri. Um, there is a different version of the legend in the Mahabharata, where King Chitrabhanu is said to be a reincarnation of a person with a similar story. But he was really just this in that story. It was a, a hunter who, who, who was up all night. You know, same thing with with Shiva, but he was thinking about his family and bringing food home for his family. So. In his essay on Shiva and self-regeneration, Raghavan Iyer tells us that what characterizes wise men, initiates, teachers, and mahatmas is the unconditional faith they can place in every single human being against all odds, despite the past and whatever the record. I'm, quote, this is, I'm reading directly from his words. This is not faith in something merely potential, but faith in that which is omnipresent, sacred, and indestructible. It is like a cry to the divine and an affirmation of willingness to persist, to be tested, to sift and select ever more clearly and wisely. To talk of Shiva is thus to get beyond a narrow focus upon one's own horizon and to take one's place within the larger whole. This is not something vague. He says, it requires hard work, the effort of thinking through the problem and beginning to look at all beings in a different way. While many of the obstacles that emerge are the familiar ones, they appear in different forms. One of them provides a clue to the subtle connection between love and asceticism. Shiva represents that strength which results from voluntary self-control carried to its highest point where it becomes effortless and full of joy. As the paradigm of yogins, Shiva is often depicted as besmeared with ashes, carrying a necklace of skulls. This signifies a clarity of vision in which there is no truck with human fantasy, desire, or ambition. But now, this is the same Shiva who was not recognized as a progenitor by the, by the Kumaras, and neither was he recognized by King Daksha, the mother or the, the, the father of, of Sati. You know, he's here is, you know, this, this ascetic, you know, with his <laughs> garland of, of skulls. You know, he's, he, he wasn't re really welcome in the court of King Daksha and, and who was supposedly one of Brahma's other mind-born sons. Asked the god he asked the goddess Shakti to take birth as his daughter in fulfillment of a boon granted by her. 
So this is Shiva, right? He asks Shiva to come be born. And, and so then, then he's got this, this daughter, Sati, who is Shiva. He doesn't know, but she took birth at Sati and married, she married herself, married Shiva. They're the same person. But King Daksha would not show respect for Shiva. Daksha organized a sacred fire ceremony, but didn't invite Sati or Shiva. And Sati went without an invitation. And to her great anguish, Daksha ignored her presence and did not even offer prasad for Shiva. And it is said that Sati was struck with profound grief by the insult. So, so, so insulted, she voluntarily gave up her body to the yajna. Now, of course, there's many different, this is like, uh, you know, I guess we call it a tradition, you know, a hundred years ago, the, the idea of sati, where the where the widow would go onto the, you know, the 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 pyre of the of a of a husband, um, you know, and, and end her life. You know, as I was reading about this, I don't know that she jumped into the sacrificial fire. I don't think that's determined. I think that she may have, through the power of her tapas, uh, you know, just self-immolated. Like it's a different type of fire than. Anyways, there's different different ways of telling the story. I wasn't there. I don't know, and but um, I'm just saying, this is a this is a person. You know, if we if we are the if the if the essence of us is the invisible spiritual fire at the center of all space, you know, when you really get in touch with that, you might just stop to be um, visible on the on on this plane. Anyway, after many years, Mata Shakti took birth as the daughter of, of King Himavat, the king of the Himalayas mountains, and her name became Parvati. She is the goddess of fertility, love, and marriage, which is said to be her gentle mother form. And many Puranas describe Parvati as Adi Parashakti, the first supreme energy, whose energy is responsible for the creation, preservation, and destruction of the universe. And she is accompanied, or she is considered to be the supreme spirit being the form. And each of her forms is worshipped as an individual. But at the time of, of, of Sati's death, Shiva, and this is the thing, they talk about him as being angry. But what happened was he tossed a lock of his hair on the ground and the lock of hair sprang up and became um, this thousand-headed, thousand-armed monster who destroyed the yajna of, of, um, of Daksha and actually beheaded him in the process. So, um, and then from the secret doctrine, it says, thus, Shiva is the destroying deity, deity, evolution and progress personified, who is the regenerator at the same time who destroys things under one form, but to recall them to life under another more perfect type. This, that was from uh, page 182 in volume two. So this shows that Daksha represents physiological or biological evolution. And since evolution cannot proceed through physical form only, Shiva destroys Daksha's sacrifice. The Theosophy speaks of the triple line of evolution, physical, intellectual, and spiritual or monadic. Shiva is concerned with the latter two. The destroying of Daksha's sacrifice also signifies that from moment to moment, life involves destruction. There is a continuous or moment to moment destruction and regeneration going on, not only in the physical body, but even at the level of thoughts and feelings. And from the secret doctrine, Shiva Rudra is the destroyer, as Vishnu is the preserver, and both are the regenerators of spiritual as well of physical nature. To live as a plant, the seed must die. To live as a conscious entity in the eternity, the passions and the senses of man must die before his body does. To live is to die, and to die is to live, has been too little understood. Shiva, the destroyer, is the creator and the savior of spiritual man, and he is the good gardener of nature. He weeds out the plants, human and cosmic, and kills the passions of the physical to call to life the perception of the spiritual man. So as we have mentioned, the Kumaras are the perfected beings from 
prior manvantras or prior worlds. And Shiva's destruction of Daksha's sacrifice also shows that Shiva and the Kumaras are not concerned with emotional satisfaction or lower passions and desires, but they are concerned with progress of animal man to human man, and finally, human man to spiritual man. Later, Shiva breathes, breathes back life into Daksha, but since his head has turned to ash in the Yagna fire, Shiva granted a goat's head to Daksha and complete forgiveness. So if Shiva represents the noumenal intelligence ceaselessly at work in the life process throughout all the elemental, mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms of nature, we are told that this intelligence is accessible not only to the highest and the holiest human beings, but to those who have made the greatest mistakes and errors in thought and action. The most sinful and depraved, whenever they have a flash of true repentance, Divine discipline involves preserving from day to day the memory of who we really are and keeping to the middle way of asceticism, such as eating or sleeping neither too much nor too little. In that way, it would seem relevant for anyone to re reflect upon Shiva as the link between the intelligence of nature and our capacity for self-regeneration. It is said that upon losing sati, Shiva, in his intense grief, had become insensible of love. Now alone, he undertook rigorous penance and retired to the Himalayas, where the sage Vasishtha wrote, There is a mountain peak, bright as the collected mass of moonbeams, penetrating the vault of heaven, where the god with the semicircular moon on his forehead delivered this doctrine to me for appeasing the miseries of the world. This mountain peak is, the fam is famed by the name of Kailasa, on which the god Hara, the consort of Guri, wearing the crescent moon on his head, holds his residence. It was to worship this great god that Vasishtha once dwelt on that mountain long ago and constructed his hermit cell on the bank of the holy stream of Ganges. The great discipline is to realize that we are not our personalities. Shiva is therefore called the dweller of ghats, burial places, where he sits in meditation with ashes smoothing his body. He has overcome the personality. All composite things are subject to change and destruction. Since Shiva presides over the death of our passions and desires. He is shown as wearing a garland of skulls and the master of time. So now, while Shiva was deep in meditation, Sati took rebirth as Parvati in the family of the god Himalaya. She performed penance. I'll tell you about that in a minute, but to break Shiva's meditation and win his attention, and it was said that she found it hard to break his meditation. So she sought the help of the gods who got the who instigated Kamadeva, the god of love, to assist by wounding him with arrows. And as Kama aimed his arrow at Shiva, Shiva felt with him within him the stirring of desire. And he realized this couldn't have happened by its own accord. And then he he opened his eye, his third eye, he spotted Kama and he and he su supposedly um, you know dissolved him. Uh, with the opening of his third eye, reduced Kamadeva to ashes. But then at the request of Kama's wife, Rati, uh, Shiva transformed Kama to Ananga, or formless. So Kama, yeah, Kama became Kamadeva, meaning he ceased being a tempter, passion being transformed into compassion. Shiva is a destroyer and regenerator. He destroys things on one plane to bring them to life on a higher plane. Kama, at one level, is the desire for sensual gratification, but at another level, it is the desire for the happiness of all beings. So Raghavan writes, certainly the effortless asceticism of Shiva was an ideal beyond all possibility for Parvati. As a young girl, 
totally devoted to Shiva and feeling totally unworthy of him. She nonetheless wanted to give her whole life to Shiva and to receive his guidance and love. Therefore, Parvati went into a tremendous tapas lasting thousands of years. It is quite overwhelming to think of so great a preparation, strengthening, purging, purifying oneself. But people have done these things and done them life after life, thus earning proximity to the great hierophants of the human race. Parvati, propelled by one-pointedness and unconditionality of love, was able to penetrate the veil of Shiva's totally impervious, impartial, and cold-seeming impersonality. She was able to touch that in Shiva which knew all along that she had to go through the fire of purgation and trial. Then he could expound to her the most magnificent mystical truths about initiation, reveal to her the magic that is possible in human life, in terms of fundamental philosophical and metaphysical principles, so that she herself came to be revered, revered as a custodian of the mysteries, invoked like Quan Yin for her boundless compassion. She is on everyone's side, and she is immensely resourceful in showing how the door can open for every single being. At the same time, however, she has no illusions and sees to the core of every human heart. So he did notice her, and it is said that their marriage was solemn, solemnized a day before Amavasya in the month of Falgun. This day of union of God Shiva and Parvati is celebrated as Mahashivaratri every year. The, and again, from, from the essay on, on Shiva and self-regeneration by Raghavan Iyer, the essential meaning of the story of Shiva and Parvati involves the hidden heart of the cosmos, the secret heart of humanity and the infinite depths within one's own immortal heart. No education in terms of the imperfect, tortuous, and complicating mind has anything to do with true concentration and understanding. Many an athlete learns to concentrate better than a person burdened by words and concepts that have nothing to do with the power of ideation. When the soul's true power of understanding is aroused, it can take wings and remain in a state of deep abstraction for hours, days, or even months visualizing that which must ultimately represent the incarnation of universal good. Genuine training in this direction can begin with the exercise of thinking outward through a series of concentric and expanding circles. It is not easy to expand one's horizon to include all the visible human beings on earth today, much less to include all human beings. Yet to understand the heart of humanity one must enlarge one's vision to encompass all human souls that are disembodied. This includes all those who died in recent centuries, leaving their shells in Kamaloka, as well as all those who died earlier and who are in various stages of Devahan, ranging from hundreds to thousands of years in duration, and who wake up at different times and come as babies onto the earthly scene becoming involved in different parts of the world, in different families, as puzzled strangers. To think consciously of all human souls in this enigmatic way is to bring one's mind closer to the perspective of Shiva. For Shiva sees all humanity at once. So we are, we're told that Shiva is the living metaphysical link between the unmanifest and manifest logos, between the lower realms of nature and beyond the human realm, which seems to point to the need for self-discipline and letting go of habitual expenditure of emotion that deadens our capacity to connect these two realms. We are told that the insight that most of human history is based upon an attempt to force upon this world schemes which must inevitably be frustrated because they are based on the lie of separateness and ignorance or unwillingness to yoke ourselves to the paradigm of the pilgrim soul who has been through every possible experience of every possible human being 
And so to be able to face facts and the disintegration of illusions of complacency that maintain a status quo where we are only half living, fascinated by external images and disconnected from the internal noumenal reality of Shiva, who is referred to as the universal frustration of all the foolish and faulty plans of deluded souls. I noticed that I'm reading at the, this next page. I, I will, this is all from this wonderful article that you will have the link to at the end of this evening. But perhaps since it's so late, I should just um, refer you to that article. And stop now. Hi, Nathan. Thank you so much. This is Desiree. I just want to express my appreciation for all of the work and that you put into this and the beautiful slides, the absolutely wonderful um, pictures. Um, I'm a crazy person when it comes to symbology. I love to, I love to be able to pick apart the little details and, um, and ask myself, I wonder what this represents in terms of law or in terms of motion or, <laughs> and, um, one of the things that we see, Shiva, in addition to the banyan tree, by the way, I you, you offered it up as a kind of uh, point of uh, contemplation, and I appreciate that because in the banyan tree you also have this picture of the the leaves, the branches and the leaves going up, but you also have those going down, and it really um, expresses the the male female aspect of of Shiva of this of this force. One of the um, I know that in his illustration in the illustrations of Shiva, he's got the um, the um, the three pointed. No, what do I call that? Triton. Mm -hmm. And do those represent? Do you, you probably already talked about it, but. Could you reiterate what those three points represent? I did it have a reference to the qualities? I'm going to ask for some help on this. It's okay. so, it's, as you as you get into this, it's like it's like oh, and now I've got to look up something to look up something. I know. <laughs> That's I know you get really um because I've been there, done that. I know. Click click so, click. So as far as, as far as I mean, I'm just thinking that it that it has some relationship to the trimurti, that to to his triple aspect, mm -hmm. which is uh, one. What's that? Which is one, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up. That we have to look look at it as one, being expressed as three, so they can't operate independently. They're actually operating all together, except that one may be more prominent at any given time. But there's, there absolutely cannot be separate from one another, um, and I think that's true in any of the forces that we that we look at is to always perceive them initially in their um, numinal oneness, and there's also the beads that are around Shiva, 108 beads, which we know 108 is is a significant number, um, but we also talk about the Sutratma of the human life or lives. And I'm wondering if there's a relationship between the 108 beaded uh, string around Shiva to the individual Sutratma. <laughs> and this is open to no, anyone. Like, just please, some somebody, observations. <laughs> and also, I want to just add there are some teachers here that have been doing this for way longer than I have. And I, 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 this was such an opportunity for me to go like, okay, where are we in time and space? Okay. So we're in the set fifth round on the fifth. Um, <laughs> yeah. I hope I was accurate. So if there's anybody who wants to point out any, any um, inaccuracies in, in, in anything that I said, I would appreciate that. But I, uh, 
but but as far as the you know, I see the relationship. I'm just I just was amazed to think about how we're related to this wondrous being, but it's like, but he's formless, or she, you know, this being is this formless, this formless being. Right. I mean, we are almost like our own linga. We are we we are symbols. This is this is just a representative. This is this is an indication of that where there's smoke, there's fire. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Well, I'm just opening it up for anyone. It's simply an observation, and I I have no um, answer to it either. Except that it, it it's an interesting parallel, and um, and uh, also speaking of symbols. There's also what I find in those illustrations, there's snakes also yeah. around um, Shiba. And is that representing time, Kala? I, I see it kind of like a, a circle encircling where somehow, um, or maybe as law. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> By the way, um, if anyone else has any questions or comments, please raise your hand. Great. Uh, uh, Nathan, this was just magnificent. Thank you so, so much. Um, just a gorgeous uh, presentation. And again, the, the visuals were incredible, but your focus and your explanation was incredible as well. But here's uh, one question that I have. I have heard uh, more than once in theosophical circles, that Shiva is the patron for esotericists. Oh. Could you talk about that a little bit? What What are your ideas about that? Well, the patron for esotericists. I mean, he's the Mahayogi. He's the he's the initiator of of initiates. <laughs> What's interesting to me, just in looking at some of the the stories from the the Hindu, you know, traditions, the, the Puranas, is that even the yogis don't know who he is. They don't even recognize him <laughs> because. So, I mean, you actually have to know him in in meditation. That's when you, because then you're, you're one with him, but mm. on the outside, he just looks kind of like a hippie, kind of like, you know, what, who is this guy? You know, he's, you know, he, he doesn't appear to be much in the eyes of the world. So, but he's, but he's, but he's not concerned with how he appears. He's got other business to, to attend to. Um, but it, as the esotericist, I'm just thinking, you know, Mount Kailash is one of these mountains on Earth that is, uh, people don't climb that mountain. And there's reasons for it because it, it, it is a sacred mountain. But, um, and, and there is, it, but it's really, that was an actual picture of the mountain that I posted. But yes, I, I, I'm hearing what you say. It just, um, I heard it a few times and it, it made me wonder um, exactly what is meant by that. But I think um, uh, your presentation just brought that up for the students. So thank you. And one more little question. The association with the goddess Kali uh, has been explained to this student as, you know, uh, the most fierce, maybe even violent um, of all the goddesses. Do you think that um, Kali is what's at work right now with climate change, with what the the extremes that we're experiencing? Oh, okay, so I did learn a little bit about this in my, in my my researching. And there's two different Kali, like the, the age that we're in is actually named after the demon Kali, which is different than the goddess Kali. Ah, uh, uh, that's big. There's that, there's that. And 
you know, it's just, it, it's, in, I'm so grateful to have the theosophical um, uh, teachings um, and the living tradition of the, the devotees of, of Shiva in this, in this time, both are very, both are very helpful in terms of, um, you know, making, in terms of definitions. Mm. Uh, Thank what you. Strike, what strikes me though, is that our theosophical teachings, particularly, you know, the, 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 the symbol articles from, from Hermes and, or, that are available on um, theosophytrust.org. By the way, everyone, I, I put that, from me to everyone is a hyperdoc with links to some some things. I've got some things on there from like definitions from Theosophy Wiki, definitions from Wikipedia, definitions from or oh, and then articles from Theosophytrust.org, um, a link to the to the Theosophical Movement article on on Shiva as the Mahayogi. So if you wanted to do a little bit more reading, you could you could find it there. But I just find that. Um, it was this was challenging for me to I, I really wanted to create a visual for everyone to to experience. And that's kind of how I started with it. But then and I wanted to know what the contemporary ideas about it are. But of course, we are at the United Lodge of Theosophists. So I wanted to put it in the theosophical context. And I just have to say it is very um, challenging, actually. It's it's quite possible that to to get caught up in the story, you know, of because uh, there's such wonderful wonderful stories which I feel have uh, some deeper significance. But sometimes we can just read the story and think that that's all there is to it, and then the Theosophical teachings really open that up a little bit um, in terms of. Um, These are not just stories that have been passed down. When 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 HPB talks about the Puranas, or when Raghavan Iyer talks about the the Puranas as being, you know, as having a, a richness and a depth, they're not talking about it in terms of a, like a cartoon. You know, this is not a comic book that they're mm -hmm. that they're talking about. They're talking about, you know, um, for for somebody who knows. Or, um, or, or maybe somebody who, in order to know, first you have to question, and then you have to seek a teacher, and you know, or we have to share with each other and say what what are some possible meanings here. These stories are not okay. So what do we have? We have the Vedas, the first three Vedas we had, and then Shiva brought in the Atarva Veda. Okay, so we've got four Vedas, and then the next kind of generation of uh, scripture in in. Um, after the you know the Vedic literature was was the was the Puranas, which are more kind of like along the folk tale line of things. That not so much like the Vedas were more about, um, from what I understand, uh, you know, rules uh, or, or 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 ceremonial or, or prayers or, or or this sort of thing. Um, and then the then the Puranas were more more. Um, you know stories, but even in those stories, HPB and Raghavan Iyer both both mention that these have some esoteric significance. But it is very challenging on the in the world of Google trying to figure out like how to present this kind of information to go deep. Thank you so much, David. Do you still have David Grossman? David, you in there? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say for what what I've always found really interesting about Shiva <clears throat> is uh first of all, most of us aren't aren't gonna go in and study the deep ancient myths, you know, of yeah. Shiva. Most people you know aren't gonna do that, although they may be on the spiritual path of life, but but Shiva as the destroyer and regenerator, I've always found uh you know, has deep, deep significance just knowing that about him. And and what you said in your talk about destroying, you might say, the illusions of one plane to open up the next to us, you know, is, is a beautiful image of, of Shiva. We have to get rid of something to get to the next next level. And uh, I guess we part we do that partly through meditation, through, uh, 
you know, seeing what's really going on within us and uh, and dis- and uh, dissolving that to have a, a greater vision of, of the whole, as you said, of the oneness of, of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva as one. Mm. If you wanted to comment on that a little bit, because you were talking in those lines about the, the separative the separativeness of life versus the oneness that that Shiva kind of pre- presents to us, I think. Yeah. I mean, and so that's where I wanted to just talk about the humanity of it or the, the human experience of it, that these stories are, are not just stories. They, they speak directly to our human experience and, and the frustration that we have with plans that don't go as we, as we wish that they would or, um, you know, I mean, in, one thing I didn't even get into is there's a whole uh, mm, school of thought in in Shaivism, I guess you would say, that um, as uh, um, Shiva as the wish fulfiller, you, you know, he's called Bolanath, which is the the innocent god, and they say, you know, he'll do anything, like. You just ask him for something and he'll do it. You know, if you're if you're a demon and and he's the outlaw god also. Like so so if you're a demon and you want you want the Shiva Linga to come home with you, you say, Hey Shiva, give me that linga. Shiva's mm-hmm. like, okay, he goes for it. If you're a if you're a uh, you know an Asur who you know says, like, I'd like you to live in my belly, he goes and lives in your belly. You know, these are mm-hmm. all these different, these are all these different stories and, and no questions asked. But the thing is, it's kind of like, I mean, it reminds me a little bit about the gospel according to Thomas which, you know, of course, in a, a, considered to be an apocryphal text, but it's, but in the gospel, according to Thomas, one of my favorite parts about it is where, where Jesus just, you know, one of the things he says is, um, do what you want to do. Don't do what you don't want to do. That's the rule, you know, like do that and you'll live a happy life. And on the one hand, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, that's, did he just say that? What, what if, what if I like ice cream? I'll just eat ice cream all the time. <laughs> Probably. But the thing is, hmm. I didn't even get into this, and and there's articles on the. If you look at the at the Shiva article or the Saturn article on in, on Theosophy Trust, eventually we're going to get tired of ice cream. You know, it's 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 the it's the there is a divine discontent that 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 settles in where you just think like, yeah, this is not this is not what it's all about. It's about something something more than that. And so when we are when we are frustrated, it's kind of a sign. Like at one point, he was. I, I made I made some mission of a story about how somebody attained bliss through through um, through following through following um, in, in. Oh yeah, by by dropping the betel leaves, he was just miserable up there in that tree. He was just worried for his life, but he was chanting the name chanting the name Shiva, but. I'm not saying that chanting the name Shiva is, 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 it doesn't quite work like that. What happens is when we, but it, but it works something like that. (laughs) It works something like that. There's something about our suffering that, that I didn't really address properly in this, in this talk, that, that suffering is this great gift that makes us into a real person where we can identify with the suffering of others that we're not just on a superficial level just if you just do things my way everything would be fine no we we are thwarted in our in our in our worldly desires and something about that being thwarted we we then become you know that's where compassion comes from we we have a common a common experience with other human human beings and so the regenerative you know, quality is, you know, it comes through like it. It is it, that we maintain our our um, you know we just remain we just remain awake and we wait patiently and 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 we we see that there's an integrity of the universe that we that we don't understand. Gosh. I mean, we take vows. That's the other thing about Shiva and being an and being an ascetic. I'm not saying I'm a master at this, but I do have some experience with taking vows. And I have found that when you keep a vow, you there like they said it says in somewhere in our literature, there is an increase in a gain in strength in body and mind. Like it's a done deal. 
And then, but eventually we, we get pulled back towards the, our old, our old ways. And, and the article she been self regeneration talks about this and it talks about how, um, you know, how it is, um, Gosh, is this the thing that I didn't talk about? Yeah, I mean, it's so sad, really, to think about it because because there are some like this is something that is available to any one of us at any time in our life, and then there's a certain sadness that Raghavan mentions about a person who late in life looks towards the mountains. There was really no reason that they couldn't have done it earlier on. Except for this incredible well, karma, you know, incredible, you know, <laughs> habit of habit of thought. Yeah. Well, Nathan, isn't it true that when we call, I guess, uh, like you said, when we take a vow, we're we're making a declaration to life, and when we call on the light, we call on the, you know, we also call on the darkness, and that's that's where uh, <laughs> the testing comes in. Yeah. I know, but you get a little bit of success and you think, well, hey, that was that that feels good. What's the big deal? I, I could do this anytime. And then for me, my experience fall off. It's like, oh, yeah, well, let's see how many years that'll take you to get back on that. <laughs> <laughs> and those would be the arrows. <laughs> <laughs> the arrows right? <laughs> One of my favorite parts of your uh, presentation had to do, um, again, going back to the symbols, was that. Um, drum that Siva was holding, I believe in its left hand, you had the trident in the one and the drum in the other, and you referenced the beating, this perpetual movement. Um, he himself being the, um, I guess, the originator of dance and, the, and so proficient in this skill that it really does re represent to me in some way the inertia of life that it is continuing. There's this constant pulsation. Um, and it reminded me of this logoic heart, you see. So there, there's so many symbols in this, in this illustration that just kind of, come out at me <laughs> that have that is just rich with meaning and like you say um so much to contemplate it can't be done in a in a single um presentation or or perhaps not even a, a lifetime but um it definitely there's so much deepness to to it how one piece can really be a clue into the archetype that is reproduced over and over and over again um and we are see we are that um so i guess we don't have to look too far because we are that and even the less we look in a certain sense the better like what, what like when raghavan was talking about how an athlete might be might get an idea about this more so than people like us who think about these ideas yes. <laughs> Because I'll tell you what, and, I, and I'm not speaking for for him at all, but it reminds me of how when a person is in the zone, whether it be in music, in athletics, in art, where that individual is so consumed and zoned in on that craft or that sport they it's almost like they lose their name in the mm -hmm. process you know what i'm saying it's like the act and the actor become one and i think in that state yes it is not a thought i mean it's not a it's an action and that thinker is now in the action rather than thinking about the action <laughs> you see what i'm saying there uh it's a lot yeah, to think about, though. Yeah. Not not a Brahman. That was something that that came to, you know, that I'm going to look up again. But that's the original sound. 
is the not, which is almost like the logos. It's the same thing, but it's also when we talk about the light of the logos, when we talk about how the logos came from the unmanifest, it's like the emanation of out of out of this invisible point in space is is the light. But yeah, when 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 you're in that zone, you you're like it's it's limitless potential, limitless creativity. You're not trying to, you know, um fit into the categories. You are you are that's where it's the process of creation. It's the it's literally where where things come from. Nothing. Nothing. Like don't try so hard. <laughs> Thank you again so much. Um, again, a wonderful presentation. I feel privileged. Are there any more questions out there in the lodge or um, in maybe, internet land? Maybe in the chat, Desiree. Okay, let me see what's there. Rose asked a question about an illustration, but I don't know which one. Um, I know that she was it Rose that asked about the the water pouring out of Shiva's oh, yeah. Shiva's head. It might have been that I can't tell exactly, because um, Rose isn't Rose. Are you here? Well, that was then, that was one of the pictures of um, how how do you pronounce the name? But it's the 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 the, the by the by. Um, Sexual, the Arden, I can't, I, where'd I put this? The ga, ga, Ganga. Yeah, I think that that's what it was, was the Ganga. But nobody mentioned, I'm just tripping out about this transgender thing, too. Because, because this God, this, who is us, who is man, we have been hung up on, on problems with, you know, in our, in our Western culture for a long time with this mistreatment of ourselves you know of of you know portrait you know, like this disparate this imbalance of of power or love or respect or something and and then now these days we have so many young people like we had i'm just saying right here in my 12 12 miles away from where i live there was a young person 16 years old choctaw young person who who recently died, and I'm sorry to say, you know, it was over this issue. They just felt like they were both. It's a two, this is a Native American thing. It's two spirit uh, is a person that we are man and woman in one body, and it doesn't depend on what organs that we have. That's the way they look. But somehow, this is this is threatening to the people in our in our times because we want to be in. So, anyways, I'm just amazed to to think that that Shiva is like way out in, in, in advance of, uh, you know, gender equality. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? I thought, uh, Bet is Betty here? Betty, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. I guess early on in the lecture, um, Nathan talked about um, Amrita. I know it's like a different context, but um, I've been reading some of the people who are like modern Gnostics talk about blue Amarita, like rose crystal liquid. And, and you were referring to it more as the, like part of the milk elixir of, um, I can't remember if it was Shiva, but yeah. Do you know anything about Mike Crowley and how he talks about like, um, the, the blue kind of like immortality liquid also. I mean, it's kind of funny because these three different cultures that are like overlapping this idea, but they all use the context slightly differently. Like, I think like the Gnostic version is sort of like, um, I mean, I'm just going to use this word loosely, but almost like love magic. Um, and then the, the the people, the modern interpretation of Crowley has in Buddhism, is he feels like, like it's sort of related to like psychedelics, how they turn um, blue. And that somehow the Hathor is like a um, metaphor for like when uh, like cows have psychedelic milk and then the, the, the Milky Way itself. But it's not like just a poem. It's sort of like, you know, this like um, fractal of of these symbols and how they do actually refer to each other. But like, I mean, because like theosophy is so like wide ranging and and 
there are a lot of sacred plants in like you know the vedas like does this do you feel like that that these stories or whichever these mythos is actually like a direct metaphor and if so like which and it's a complex question but wow. if in the back of your mind you knew any of these things i love that question because i do think that we're not this is the thing like these are there's stories and then there's stories and i think that there's i think that there's something real happening here and you just i don't know how to answer your question but i just want to share that what i was just thinking about fire and how within the fire if anybody's spent some time looking at a fire at a log fire you know yeah there's the blue inside of the 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 red and yeah. you know it's this it's that noumenal essence it's the spiritual fire it's the I don't know about yeah, that you're, that you're that you're talking about. And again, we don't know. It's going to take me a couple lifetimes. I've just started in the last couple of years reading the Secret Doctrine, and it's pretty amazing how she how she will explain. You know, the, in in all of the in all of the traditions, it seems there are blinds. There are things that are written that even unless you have a teacher, you're not going to understand the, the deeper significance of it, but that doesn't mean that you can't meditate. <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. The one you said about how on um, the woman, she didn't just throw herself into the fire. She probably like burned that holy fire in herself. Cause like, I do think like a lot of those times those poems are misinterpreted, not poems, you know, holy books are, are misinterpreted because it's usually like people are not reading it themselves or going through like a priest or someone else. And I think that actually does make a lot of sense. So well, anyway. dead letter, <laughs> when yeah. you read something in dead letter, of course it's going to get um, abused and probably politicized and then weaponized. So. I think we better probably time's up. Okay. Well, thanks again. Nate, um, for that wonderful gift and um, looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Great job. Really beautiful. <laughs> so good, Nathan. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, Nathan. Namaste. 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 And everyone have a wonderful evening. Namaste. Happy Namaste. Holiday. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Desiree. You're very welcome. Thanks, Nathan. See you guys later. Thank you.